Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the KU School of Medicine. We're so pleased that you could join us for this evening's program, LGBTQ Advocacy and Awareness. My name is Crystal Nevins, and I'm the Director of Human Resources here at the school. Tonight's event is sponsored by the school's Diversity and Inclusion Steering Group and is part of an ongoing initiative to provide an increasing level of programming around diversity and inclusion topics. In 2014, the American Academy of Medical Colleges, the AAMC, published the first edition of a free curriculum titled Implementing Curricular and Institutional Climate Changes to Improve Healthcare for Individuals Who Are LGBT, Gender Nonconforming, or Born with DSD, which stands for Difference in Sexual Development. The AAMC strongly urges medical providers to familiarize themselves with the health needs of this health minority and emphasizes the crucial importance of providing good medical care for everyone. In observance of Pride Month, we at KU, with the support of Dean Menz, decided to bring together a group of individuals who provide medical care, as well as various levels of social, emotional, and resource support to members of the LGBTQ family through sickness, health, and social adversity. I'm pleased to welcome our speakers for tonight's program. Each of them will be presenting this evening in their area of expertise related to LGBTQ advocacy and education with a special emphasis on medical care and their unique needs. Dr. Sarah Husseini, over here, is a clinical associate professor in family medicine here at the KU School of Medicine. Grayson Barnes, here he is, thank you, is a professor of arts and humanities at Butler Community College. Dr. Don Loudon joins us from the Heartland Women's Group where she practices OBGYN. She is also a clinical assistant professor here at KU. Helena Popejoy serves as an advocate with the Wichita Area Sexual Assault Center, specifically as an LGBTQ outreach advocate. And finally, Liz Haymore, who will be joining us later this evening, is the chair of the Wichita chapter of the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. During this evening's program, we will get acquainted with the health disparities faced by LGBTQ individuals. We will become familiar with the proper terminology in order to convey respect. Several of our speakers will focus on local initiatives that are improving care for LGBTQ individuals. And finally, at the end of our program, we invite you to ask questions and share your own experiences. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Sarah Husseini. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Sarah Husseini, and I am a, uh, a clinical assistant professor with the family medicine department um, at uh, Via Christi at KU. And um, about two and a half years ago, I had um, I overheard a conversation uh, going on between a uh, one of my one of the residents, one of our learners, and a faculty, and they were talking about how they were going to send this. Uh, trans woman to KU to find a primary doctor. And I said, how come, you know, none of our doctors can be her primary doctor? We have tons of residents who are open, their panels are open. And uh, uh, the, the teacher looked at me, who's a wonderful, compassionate, kind man. And he said, this is a trans woman. We cannot take care of her. Uh, she needs to go to a special place. And I said, uh, how is a trans woman different? from a cis woman, um, you know, she has the same organs and she's, and she, and that's not a, you know, the healthy message we're giving someone is that there's, you're so different, you cannot be part of my clinic. And that, uh, and that kind of got me thinking and, uh, and kind of reflecting on the culture uh, that we have with trans individuals. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the College Hill United Methodist Church asked me if I would do some educational session about transgender health. And the truth was, I did not know anything about transgender health. Um, but instead of telling them that, I called a friend and she runs an LGBT clinic and she said, you can't tell them you don't know. What you're going to do is you're going to get educated. And uh, I'll send you the materials and you will read and um, and that's how my journey in educating primary care providers and health care providers about transgender health started was with that lecture after that instance. And what I've learned, actually, um, was that 
uh, transgender health is is fairly simple, and it's uh, and you can do it, and you will be ex and we will be expected to do it um, to give transgender individuals medical homes um, right where they're at. They don't need to be sent anywhere, and right right where they are. So I um, what I'm going to do is I was just going to go over some basic terms. I'm not going to give you the medical lecture of what it's like to be a doctor, a primary care doctor, and have a transgender uh, individual come to you, through your doors, and, and what do you do? How do you um, address, you know, address, I, I will do that a little bit, but what I kind of wanted to share just before I get started was um, when we started, when I started this project two years ago, I wanted to have some, um, to research it, and I wanted to prove that the knowledge and attitudes and comfort in treating can be changed through a 60-minute session that includes 30 minutes of education, 20 minutes of uh, patient narratives, and then 10 minutes of Q&A. And uh, we were able to do the study, conduct it, and then prove that the attitudes improve st with a statistically dif uh, significant change, the knowledge and the comfort in treating, and that change persisted after three months. So after three months, we surveyed the people, and they were still comfortable in treating. And um, so that's that to me that's very encouraging to me what that tells me is that um as as medical educators we're still not we're not educated ourselves but it's not very hard it's f fairly simple and when we educate our learners then they become a very adequate or a lot more adequate than what they started in caring for uh trans people and after that really i kind of um you know looked at the whole um lgbt spectrum and that's um it's, um, you know, so we'll have different people talking about, you know, different things. But what happens when we don't care for every single member of our community is we don't have a community that is as healthy as it would be. Uh, please come in. As, as it would be when, when, we, when we do. And um, any society that does not care and welcome every single member of it is going to be you're going to you're going to be able to tell the deficits and the reason I tell people the reason I want them to and I try to do my part in educating about LGBT health is that I'm doing it for the patient but I'm also doing it for the provider and um, so with that I'll just kind of go over some basic terms and if you are very familiar and very well versed I mean excuse us that's uh, we kind of just uh, gender identity is the sense of oneself as male, female, uh, masculine, feminine, both leaning towards um, non-gender. Uh, so, what what gender is is very simple. Gender is between your ears, and sex is between your legs. You are born with a sex. Um, most people, the majority of people, 95% of individuals are born with a gender between their ears and a sex between their legs that match. 5% of people are on the, on the spectrum where um, you're, this is not, it does not correspond to your, your anatomical characteristics, your chromosomal characteristics or a variant. So a transgender person is someone whose gender identity is different from their sex assigned to them at birth. Uh, and then the orientation, it can, you know, who you're romantically, sexually, affectionately attracted to, and there's, there are so many um, some, I think somebody was uh, telling me that there's like 50 different, you know, variations of relating to people. But as medical providers and as people, you really basically what you need to know is what pronouns does a person go by? What do they prefer so that you can, um, every time you address them and you interact with them, you're not basically insulting their humanity and telling them that you're not listening to what they ask you. So really what we, the, something, something super basic that we teach is respecting somebody's preferred gender identity and using their preferred pronouns. Um, and remembering that a transgender person uh, has some traits that do not conform to their gender identity. And anatomy does not define, define trans people. I don't think anatomy should define anybody. This is as logical as me telling you that someone having certain measurements or certain color is going to define who they are. And to me, I look at, at people, um, at trans folks, and that's the, it's the same thing. People are who they tell you they are and who they want you to see as they are. And when, whenever we talk about youth, that's really the, um, 
and and Liz will talk about a lot about the youth um, um, transgender youth it, she'll tell you about like what happens when you don't listen to somebody telling you to so just some numbers so um, the old statistics it said that 0.3 percent of people are transgender I was just talking to Grayson he said 700,000 transgender people are um, you know like identify have um, how is it how is that so this right that number came uh, the 0.3 percent came from people um, saying that you in order for me to acknowledge that somebody is transgender they have to have a sex confirmation surgery and we don't that is not the case somebody is transgender uh, I tell you that I'm you know this is who I am and it does not conform necessarily with my anatomy or what you perceive in me and that's that's how I'm not a cisgender I am transgender um, and so for up to 5%, and I go by the 5% number, it's really 5% of people will, will experience some, ex, some extent of gender dysphoria where you, the, role, the gender role that is assigned to you is not really what you feel authentic with and, um, and not the, the, the gender expression. Certain cultures, you know, if you're a female, you have to wear a dress. I think we are, we're in a culture that is kind of, you know, it's, uh, more flexible, especially for non-gender conforming uh, women. Uh, not so much, uh, not so much for gen non-gender conforming, um, you know, male-born individuals. Um, so one percent of birth are um, classified as ambiguous or a difference in sexual development. And I will tell you that ever since I did, I started doing this work, I started to really look at female newborns uh, and at male newborns. And um, because no, not everybody here in this audience in, is a medical individual, I will tell you that before I have examined hundreds of babies and I was not attuned to paying attention. If something was really obvious or fairly obvious, but now I understand that there are features in a female that I think, you know, as female newborn or a male newborn that are, that could mean that this individual's hormonal level or uh, is, you know, needs to be paid attention to. And when I was doing my work about transgender, I kind of wanted to kind of see what, what, what's the brain function and anatomy of transgender um, uh, individuals and really I, I read a lot of studies that did the the, the functional scans of the brain and a, and a and a cis male and a trans male have very similar functioning brains and a cis woman and a trans woman have very similar brain anatomy so the parts that differentiate a, a cis man and a trans and a, a cis woman's so men and women's brains uh, there, there are certain parts of the brains that are smaller and then there are certain parts of the brains that light up differently and um, there are, there are two theories about what makes someone um, what makes someone cisgender and what makes someone transgender. It is believed that the majority of people, uh, their, their hormonal level when they're in the womb um, is consistent with their, is consistent with the, with the gender and the, the sex. And then, so they are cisgender. And then there are some uh, individuals where the hormonal levels in a fetus, if they're not, if they're different, you're going to see a gender, either a, some some sort of gender noncompliance or just, you know, transgender uh, individual. Um, but then there's also another, like other theories, uh, but this, to me, this was extremely touching. For me, t for me as a physician, to tell someone to not, to not validate an individual and tell them that because they don't have the anatomy, um, or the chromosomal, uh, the chromosomes that this is not someone when I know that their brain is functioning a certain way to me that felt like so um, crazy as a, a, a non-scientific. And so to me, that's always an, an argument that I have whenever I'm discussing someone who tells me, you know, this is something made up or, you know, who wants to invalidate uh, tra transgender people. So... Um, uh, more uh, along the numbers, so 90% of transgender patients were refused care based on their gender identity, and I've, I was the witness to one instance that happened, um, either because of ignorance or because of resistance and negative feelings from the providers. Uh, and it really it doesn't really matter because as a, as a patient, you're being refused care, you're not cared for, and it, it, it does not, it's not a good experience. Um, so up to 48% of transgender People will be uh, will delay seeking care because of 
financial restraint, and then up to a quarter of them will not seek medical care because of discrimination that they have uh, felt. Um, and then when one study that was published in 2015 uh, says that 50% of transgender people feel like they educate their providers about their care. And um, I, every, every transgender friend that I have has told me that 100% of them told me that they had to educate their providers about like what they needed. Um, they're a lot more likely to be victims of uh, physical violence and uh, sexual coercion, unfortunately. It happens especially with trans women. Um, and they're a lot more likely to have suicidal ideation. Um, I, um, I encourage people to go to those references. And if you're interested, we can email you those references. They're very basic and very helpful. And whether you're a medical person, whether you're a patient, whether you are someone who wants to be an advocate or someone who feels resistant and not convinced, I think that just going through those uh, the Fenway Institute, you know, it just kind of it has a very simplistic, very basic, uh, the, Amer the American uh, Medical Student Association, again, and then my favorite is the, Uni uh, the University of California at San Francisco, and uh, then MedEd Portal has. So um, for me to, like, summarize where I come from um, in terms of being a transgender health advocate and um, I think that as a provider, not knowing is not an option anymore. And telling your patient that you cannot, you're a primary care provider and you can't prescribe them hormones, you may be able to not prescribe them hormones, but you're not going to be able to not be their doctor. Because, um, and also like the thing about diagnosing, uh, getting baseline hormonal level, and if the individual chooses to be on hormone replacement, starting the hormone replacement, looking for side effects and all that. I didn't go into any of that, but it's, it's very simple. How I summarize it to people is I am a cis woman, and I'm, I'm experiencing difficulty with um, my secondary sexual features, uh, whether I'm having a lot of uh, her hirsutism or, you know, uh, the doctor is going to check my, my hormonal level. And then if my hormonal level as a cis woman who identifies as a woman is not in the range that it should be, they are going to suppress my testosterone that women naturally have, and they're going to give me estrogen. And so as basic as that is, and then they're going to follow my levels and look at the side effects of the, of the medication effects like the liver and the fat, uh, the, the cholesterol and the lipid levels. So they would, you know, that's it's fairly simple. You do that. Um, if I present as a, you know, and I'm a trans woman, the doctor is going to suppress my testosterone and give me estrogen, follow my levels to see where what level I'm in, and look for the side effect. Um, as a cis male, I go to the doctor, and I have trouble with testosterone-related, you know, issues. Uh, this, those are theoretical set settings that I'm just going to, and the doctor is going to check my testosterone level, and if it's low, I will get testosterone injections. Um, as a trans man, I go to the doctor, and I, I, the doctor will check my baseline level and then give me testosterone to, to get me in the range. And then the same thing you would do for cis, cis individuals or trans individuals is what you want to see is you want their hormonal level of their gender to be within the range and look for side effects. So it's as basic as that. Um, individuals who are trans do not need to have, if they're not minor, minors still need uh, a psycho formal psychological evaluation. But now the uh, American Academy of Medical Education, it does, you do not need as a trans individual, you don't need a psychologist certifying that you are a trans. You are a trans person if you tell me that your gender and your sex are not aligning. That's as simple as that. Uh, I will support you as your physician by giving you the resources. If you have diagnosable um, any mental illness, I will support it. Counseling is always indicated. But we don't make people, you know, wear men's clothes and go by male pronouns. I mean, sometimes the doctor is the first person who will support you. And if you go to a doctor who does not know or does not care, then you've prolonged your suffering as a trans individual unnecessarily. Um, what happens with the youth, I just had a patient at my clinic show up. Um, 
uh, with uh, with their mom, um, and they are. Um, I I saw that patient when they were uh, when they identified as you know female. They're born female. They identif they they went with male uh, with female pronouns, and then uh, they came out to their mother as trans and wanted to have male pronouns, wanted to be put on hormones, and wanted to kind of talk about it. So um, so I, they came to see me, and the mom. Is um, so I expl I kind of explained to the mom what's you know what's the what's the process and because this individual is 15 we have to have some psychological some formal psychological assessment um, if someone has not started puberty yet what we do and they're telling you this is wrong you know I'm I'm not a girl but I'm growing breasts I'm not a girl but I'm having a period you pay attention to them they're not they they need they need. So sometimes what we do is we stop the puberty until we go through enough counseling, enough certainty, and then we allow them to have puberty into the proper gender. And that's very ideal, and it doesn't often happen, but it should. That's the American Academy of Pediatrics stand and guidelines on transgender youth. Um, screening for gender dysphoria, screening for um, just taking an intake about uh, sexual orientation is a must when you're a pediatrician when you have a well child check so it's not it's not something that you can as a pediatrician or as a family doctor say I don't know what, what to do you have to know what to do what you do is you talk to the family you seek counseling and then um, in the case of my patient who they have gone through um, you know female puberty but they that's not a wanted puberty is I started just by talking to the mom and kind of understanding where she is, where that family is. A minor will need consent. You cannot treat a minor uh, for gender dysphoria without the consent of their family. And many, many, many youth in our country are um, get become homeless. Uh, they become disowned, and um, it's very difficult for them because there's really no support for transgender youth enough support but I've seen parents who are lovely they're um, not that the ones who disown their kids and um, you know don't talk to them they're not lovely they're just not in a lovely place I just they're they're supportive and I and I supported that mom I said you're gonna grieve you're gonna your daughter is going away and it's no different than having a child die and having a child born and she cried she said you know that's exactly what it is and um, and I and I did not come up with that. I wish I did, but I have heard families and I've heard transgender people say, you know, it's you're dealing with death and you're dealing with birth. And when they're together, I mean, the, you grieve and you celebrate, and you're mourning and you're happy, and it's happening at the same time. And it would be nice if your doctor and if your community supported you and knew, um, you know, what to do and what to say, or at least tried. Um, and so with that, I will. Um, Grayson, um. yeah. Yeah. thanks, Dr. Husseini. My name is Grayson Barnes. I'll let you. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> my name is Grayson Barnes, and I apologize if my voice cracks. But I'm a 15-year-old boy in a 57-year-old body, so bear with me. Um, and, and I think it's real important to have the support of your physicians in a transition like this. Luckily, the, my primary care physician is someone who does prescribe testosterone to men who are having testosterone problems, so he was pretty aware of what might happen to me. Um, in fact, the last time we got together, we compared beard growth. So he's, he's about my age, and I guess I obviously have more hair than he does because my 5 o'clock shadow comes in about 3.30 now. So that really has made me feel very good about things. Um, I know that when I first came to this understanding of myself, I was not in the position of some trans people. And this is my experience. Everyone's experience is different. You could almost equate experiencing transness with experiencing a spiritual awakening, if you will. Some people know they're spiritual all their lives, and some people go, oh, my gosh, here, this is what it's, what's meant to be. And for me, it wasn't that way. I know when I was very young, I kept telling my parents that I was supposed to be a boy because I wanted to grow up to be daddy. I knew that daddy had a role associated with it. I didn't understand it was associated with gender so much. Um, and as I got older, I lived with parents who were very, very accepting when I told them that, well, you know, I really like women. 
My dad's list didn't exactly include that, as you can imagine, since I was born female. He says, okay, don't bring this home, don't bring this home. But when I brought home a woman, he said, well, I guess that wasn't on the list. So that was kind of their attitude. But I also knew that that's not really what I wanted either, because I still, part of me, wanted to be daddy. And it took a later-in-life crisis, essentially, to sort of make me really understand what this was. And that crisis was, as a spiritual person, as well as all kinds of other things, uh, a crisis at my church, uh, the, the end of an 18-year relationship, and knowing that I was getting older and I was turning into an old woman and it was somehow wrong. Because I would look at myself in that mirror and I would say, no, this is not right. This is completely wrong. And with a, the assistance of a therapist, I started to figure out, well, you know, what is it that I want? And it finally, I had to accept the fact that I was either going to, because I was, I was doing the suicidal ideation. I was in that percentage there that Dr. Husseini was talking about. It's like nothing was going right for me. Uh, I wasn't performing properly at work. I'm a professor. And you know, when you're at numbered 150 to 1, you really do have to keep your chops up. And so it took that to sort of get me to start looking at what was going on and made me realize that, hey, this part of me that's been raising my hand all my life, you know, in certain situations I'd be doing something, I'd be bailing hay, and someone would say, don't you really want to be a guy? You know, I'd be, I worked in the car business for a long time. I'd be in the service department, and I'd be slopping out a stall somewhere that, where there was an oil spill, and someone would come along and say, don't you want to be a guy? And so this was really how I kind of came to my authentic self. And I didn't really get a chance to explore that as quickly as I would have liked either because as an aging person, there were other things that I had to check out first. And there are things that don't have anything to do with me being trans, but my age really had something to do with preventing me from living authentically for a long time. For example, I do have a couple of growths on my thyroid. I had to check my thyroid levels and make sure that those things were okay before I could start testosterone. Uh, the endocrinologist that I was referred to by my primary care physician said, okay, we need to check this out and make sure it's okay. I had to wait two years before I could start to take testosterone. And that was a two years that I remained essentially in crisis. Mitigated, of course, luckily, because I happen to be someone who has really good insurance, so I could go to a therapist or a counselor. I think about my other trans brothers and sisters who do not have that option, who cannot, as they're going through a period of what may or may not be emotional crisis, physical crisis, until they can potentially do what they need to do. And there was a part of me that thought, well, hey, do I really need to transition physically? Because I've been driving around this body for so many years, I know how it works. You know, it's kind of like the rental car that, you, that you've gotten comfortable with before you go pick up your real car at the dealership after they've repaired it. It's like I can keep putting things together. I keep losing things, though. I keep losing, like, a gallbladder here or something else. Okay, so it's sort of a used car. I said, well, you know, I really don't know that I need to transition. But when there are other psychological issues that are associated with it, such as suicidal ideation and just going to end it all because I don't know what's going to happen, and the other thing that is also part of trans experience is fear. And I want to talk to you very sincerely about that fear. I was afraid of what I might become. I never felt like I was a very good-looking woman because I was dealing with other kinds of psychological things, such as, A, I wasn't a woman, um, B, that I was trying to be a woman unsuccessfully, C, I am a victim of sexual abuse, so there may be other mitigating circumstances. I was abused by relatives. I was raped when I was in the military, so I was also recovering from those sorts of issues. So I certainly didn't want to become a man. All of those who had perpetrated that violence upon me had been men. I'm not saying it can be exclusively men by any means, but why did I want to become something that had hurt me? Fear number one. Fear number two, I'm an aging person. 
what happens if there's a complication because of the testosterone? What happens if it, which is a possibility, causes another issue such as cervical cancer? What happens if, because I already had anger issues, what happens if that testosterone creates even more intense anger issues? How am I going to deal with that? And I have to stand up in front of 150 people every semester and make sure that in sometimes very tense situations, I keep my cool. I was also afraid of what my body might become. I mean, I sort of had this fairly pragmatic idea that at 57, well, I started finally testosterone when I was 55, I, I had a very pragmatic idea that I wasn't going to turn out looking like, oh, you know, some of these male models, which is the epitome. And for someone who was raised in the humanities, you know, that Greek god is always kind of the epitome, right? It's like, I know I'm never going to look like that, but what will I look like? Will I look like the burly guys on my mom's side? Will I look like the hairless, skinny guys on my dad's side? You know, what am I going to look like? And then there's also the increasing societal fear at that time, which I'm sure most of you are aware, that uh, what bathroom do I use? And I want to tell you that minority stress is something that trans people suffer because I can go to my work, and partly through my own work, I can go to Butler Community College and I can use any of the restrooms there, and I will be supported, and if necessary, I will be escorted by the police force there because they say, by policy, I'm allowed to use the restroom that I want to use. I can go to WSU campus. I can come here and use the restroom that I want to use. But what if I go to Quick Trip? What if I go somewhere else? And I have been accosted in restrooms. I have had people tell me, look, you're in the wrong restroom. And even though there was some big, huge guy banging on a door at a Quick Trip one night telling me that I was in the wrong room, that wasn't nearly as scary as the little old lady in the woman's room looking at me. Somehow that was more frightening. I don't know why. but um, So I, I will take that stress with me as well. On the other side, there is this, this, this joyous discovery that is absolutely amazing. And it is so wonderful to be able to tell other people how fantastic this is. It's great to be able to say, wow, look at this. It's great to be able to say, wow, I'm really getting a lot of hair on my arms up here. Isn't this wonderful? You know, and I want to be able to tell people that maybe I'm losing a little bit more of the hair on my head that I can comb, and I have a lot more on my back that probably needs a brush. I want to be excited about that, and it's good to have folks who are in your court, if you will, okay? And my primary care physician is very much in my court. My therapist is very much in my court. I have friends, luckily, unlike a lot of trans people who are very much in my court. And the most amazing thing of all is that I have a father, and let me give you a little bit of background on him. He's 87 years old. He is a staunch Republican. You can probably guess who he voted for in the last election. Retired military, master sergeant. He's the one who said, well, I guess that wasn't on the list when I brought a woman home. But I was still afraid to say, Dad, can I have your middle name as my name? His middle name is Gray. And so I wanted to be Gray's son because I knew he always wanted a son. We have a, I have a brother who's adopted. But throughout my life, he's always said, well, it's not exactly the same thing. You know, it's not exactly the same thing. And I wanted to be able to use his name. And I said, I have something to tell you, Dad. And he said, what's that? You can tell me anything. And I said, okay, um, you've always had a son. He says, well, yeah, I know. Neil you know, blah, blah, talks about my brother. I said, no, you've always had two sons. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I am really inside myself a male. And I would like to present that to the rest of the world, the man that I want to become. And I, I really want you to know that you are part of the reason that I want to be the man I was meant to be because you are such a fine example of a man. And he says, you know, I always knew that there was something going on with you because there was always something holding you back. And he said, maybe this is it. But I want to tell you this. You're my kid. I love you. 
and I want you to ensure that you do whatever you have to do as pos- that, that, that you have to do and make sure it's possible to make sure that your physical self aligns with your emotional self. He said, but you're older. Thanks, Dad. Be careful. He said, I love you. And that is the other thing that's very important. And when you look back at these levels of support, these are the things that provide joy. And these are the things that get me out of my house when I feel like, my God, I do not want to put a binder on today. Because the first time I ever tried to put on a binder, I was by myself. It was not a happy thing. Luckily, I lived in an old house, and I finally, I was all tangled up. I couldn't use my hands to get out, okay? And I found a doorknob, and I got the back of the binder on the doorknob, and I managed to wriggle myself out of the thing. Now, there are medical complications that could result from wearing binders because I am trans. I have scoliosis. Will my scoliosis be exacerbated or not because I am binding right now? And I could choose not to bind, but can I choose not to bind? You see? Um, I am reactive to certain medications. That's not because I'm trans. I am an asthmatic. I have exercise-induced asthma. You know, I always joke, it's like I really love the military except the running part because I could never breathe while I move my legs that fast. That doesn't have anything to do with me being trans. So when I go to my primary health care provider, it is so good for me to be able to say, hey, I'm having this problem, and to have him understand that it isn't because I'm trans, but it's because I'm human. Now, there are other things that that can be aggravated by the testosterone, the thinning of mucous membranes and those sorts of things. Um, And I have had some problems with that. I've had mouth sores, and we have determined that that is partly related to the thinning of mucous membranes and the testosterone. So we had to back off on the testosterone a bit. The other thing is, is that people have made me very aware if we back off on the testosterone, that means that you're going to look less masculine a lot longer. So those are the kinds of questions that are very important to know the answers to. You know, what are the reactions of this particular hormone on someone's body? What kinds of things will this person have to go through because they have chosen to live? And I'm going to use this word very, very importantly. This term is authentically. It took me a long time to always figure out that I was a man. I really would like the rest of the world to figure it out too and to try to take the same sorts of steps in understanding and sensitivity towards this revelation as I have. Because I feel that a level of compassion in all of our dealings, whether they are professional or personal, is always important. And I think Dr. Husseini was commenting earlier about this idea that we need to be able to listen to people and our patients And I'm always reminded of a Fulani proverb. And this proverb is, I am who they are. The biggest memory is, or the biggest understanding is, is that I'm not doing this transition alone. I'm not living authentically alone. Everyone else is living authentically with me. And I kind of joke with my students because I'm up in front of 150 people every semester. And I had to come out to my students. I figured I had no choice. Because when I started taking testosterone, I was going to be in front of 150 people who would see me visually change, who would hear my voice get lower. And I always joke that I'm kind of doing a costume change on stage, you know, like some of those really great acts do. So how is it that as medical care professionals, um, folks can help their patients do whatever costume change on stage they feel is necessary? Thank you. Those are a couple of, a couple of tough acts to follow. So hope, I hope this isn't too medical um, or too dry. Um, I don't have a ton of experience taking care of transgendered individuals. Um, I have an OBGYN clinic, which is woefully poorly prepared for that, I realized, as I started doing reading for this. Um, so I'm working on making that easier. Um, 
I have taken care of quite a few lesbian couples. That does, I, I think we do a pretty good job with that. I, I honestly don't see them any different than anybody else um, and, and enjoy taking care of them um, through pregnancies and surgeries and, and life events, and that, that has been fantastic. Um, so I just I did a little reading and put together oops, um, just a few medical things. I know some of you are medical um, providers and students, um, and I, I don't need to discuss definitions because that's been done quite well. Um, discuss barriers to care and some solutions that we can think about, um, some inclusive office and unique considerations for routine medical care. Um, for every individual, family planning, um, which I think sometimes gets overlooked, and some insurance considerations, which frankly is a moving target for all of us um, at this juncture. Um, so we'll skip those. So I would guess that the biggest um, barrier to care is anxiety and discomfort um, on the patient's part. And I think as providers, we need to do everything that we can to try and make them more comfortable. Um, a lot of these patients have been through prior physical and emotional trauma, um, and so they are hesitant to kind of bear their soul and their body to a new person. Um, there is a huge lack of acceptance and understanding from us. Um, I think at least at my age, when I sat in this room for a lot of hours, um, we got nothing. We got no medical training whatsoever about any type of LGB issues, nothing. Um, wasn't even discussed. Uh, it was a few years ago. Um, and, you know, I think if we want to do it now, we have to seek that out on our own. And uh, a lot of people just don't have time. They don't think about it. And um, we need to do a much better job. My, I've already scheduled a lecture for our residents for the upcoming year to try to improve that. Um, and then, again, insurance concerns. You know, it, when you think about it, I, didn't, I had never thought about this, but if you come in and you have legally changed your name to a male name and your documentation is all male and I send in a bill for a pap smear, it, what's going to happen with that? Um, so these are things that you really don't think about until it's sitting in front of you and you go, hmm, wow, how am I going to get that covered? Well, at least with some insurance companies now, I discovered there's a modifier that can be put on the, the paperwork. So we just have to think ahead about these things and um, help the patients get proper coverage. So what can we do as providers? Get educated, get educated, get educated. It doesn't really take a lot. I sat down in a 24-hour in-house call for the residents and got online and read a ton of fantastic websites. Um, we need to educate our staff. Um, a lot of our staff are kind of the same age group as me, and we didn't really get a lot of training in school. Um, review and revise the paperwork. A lot of those um, references that were up on the screen earlier have sample intake forms that we can hand out at our office and have the patients fill out. And it should be handed to every single patient. They should all be the same. Um, what name do you prefer to be called? What is your gender identity? What sex were you assigned at birth? And what pronouns would you like us to use when we address you? Um, that's huge for us, and I, we do have a few patients in our clinic, and, it's, and, it, and it changes, um, and we just really need to be inclusive and aware and make sure that we are, are consistent um, when we address those patients. And then create an inclusive office environment, um, a gender-neutral rest, uh, restroom, um, and flexible appointment times. Um, you know, if, if someone came to me and said, I'm new to this, I'm transitioning, I'm very uncomfortable looking like a male sitting in a, a, a GYN clinic, I would absolutely have them come in early or I'd have them come in late. Um, I just need to know that I need to do that. And we would absolutely work with, with anybody um, to make that happen. And I think most physicians would. We just need to know. Um, so that, that's one thing that, um, that I would like to work on, um, at our office. I'm having trouble with the right and the left here. Um, so for the office visit itself, establish good rapport and assurance of acceptance and respect with the patient, um, and take a very careful history 
gender identity, sexual orientation, transition plans, any hormone use um, at the time, um, sexual behaviors, um, what, what, who do you have sexual relationships with. Um, that isn't to be offensive, it's to give us an idea of what we need to screen for. Um, reproductive plans, that's huge. Um, I think that's something that gets overlooked. Um, if we have the opportunity to see somebody before they start their transition, we can offer um, preservation of sperm or preservation of eggs if somebody would like to do that. And I think that sometimes gets missed. We miss it with our cancer patients too a lot of times. Um, so that's something that needs to be discussed. And then, of course, emotional support and resources um, we need to provide to every patient. Um, and then medical considerations. Um, the exam should be based on the patient's reason for the visit. If they came to see you for, you know, a sore arm, don't ask them to get undressed, you know, um, just like anybody else. Um, and you need to assess the patient's comfort level. You may have to do this in several visits. The first visit, you may just talk. Um, and that needs to be fine need to not be in a hurry. If it's going to be a long appointment, just say, hey, why don't we do this in two or three steps? And I think that'll be more comfortable. Um, the health screenings, that's a little bit different. We have to think about it. Um, we need to know what hormones the patient is on, what organs they still have left that need to be screened. Um, and this, you, basically everything, standard recommendations. Um, for, for both, you know, a, as they stand for both cis men, trans men, cis women, trans women, all should be screened the same. There are a few little differences. Mammograms can sometimes be less often, um, depending on hormones and things like that. But basically, we need to know where people are in the transition, if they're at all. And you have to keep in mind, screen the organs that are there um, and, and don't miss things. Um, and then... Unique exam considerations, um, such as binding and tucking, which um, Grayson mentioned earlier, um, we need to be sure and take to do a good exam because there's the risk of skin breakdown, um, just like there would be like with a pressure ulcer, and we need to be aware of treatment, um, proper treatment for that, and for um, any, sometimes people can get a dermatitis type um, reaction from the binding, so that would be something to take into consideration. And then family planning. Um, discuss contraception. Don't make assumptions. I've seen many missteps um, over the years of people who have unfortunate medical outcomes because somebody said, oh, you can't get pregnant after such and such. Well, you can. <laughs> and so don't, don't assume. Don't assume anything. I, it, it's... We currently have a patient who's carrying a pregnancy right now because somebody said, oh, when you're taking this testosterone, you can't get pregnant. Well, you can. Um, and just because somebody is in a relationship with a particular gender, don't assume that that's always the gender that that person is with. Um, I've seen several unfortunate incidents of unplanned pregnancies or medical procedures done to a patient that shouldn't have been done to somebody who may someday want a pregnancy. And five years down the road, they're in a different relationship and they want a pregnancy and they can't. And nobody ever told them that because they assumed that once they were in a lesbian relationship, they would always be in a lesbian relationship. And so I, I just, I n never assume anything. Um, and again, discuss childbearing and child rearing um, desires. and. You know, that obviously that goes for everybody. It goes for every couple, every patient. Um, are they interested in pregnancy? Do they would like information about surrogacy? Um, and my friendly reproductive endocrine person up there will help us out. Um, versus adoption and, and then breastfeeding options. Um, there is a, uh, a program that was actually very good. I never read all the way through it. The Newman Goldfarb Protocol that we can actually take patients through to induce lactation in a patient who has not had a pregnancy. So if you have a couple who is adopting or if you have a couple who um, both partners would like to breastfeed, we can do that. 
Um, so we need to be sensitive and aware and offer that up um, to patients because a, a, a lot of people don't realize that you can do that. Um, it's, it's difficult and takes some work, but it can be done. And then uh, back to the insurance coverage. Um, so modifier code 45 was what I found, um, which is the sex mismatch code. Um, and routine care should always be covered. We should always, it may take a phone call or a letter or something, but a patient's pap smears, mammograms, prostate screening, those things should always be covered. Um, transgender inclusive care coverage is variable based on location and carrier. Um, some progress had been made. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen now. Um, there may be some backsliding, but um, there at least there have been some companies that have included that. And in summary, everyone's a unique person, and everyone deserves to be treated respectfully and equally by the medical community. And we need to do better about that. Um, and that's regardless of any personal beliefs or biases. Um, we need to partner with and advocate for our patients. And as for the, the ones of you out there who may be our patients, um, we ask you for trust and guidance. Most of us, at least as older ones, didn't get adequate training in any kind of culture or gender sensitivity, and we need your help. Um, if we stumble and fumble around and do stupid things, tell us. Um, we don't do it on purpose. We try to, we try to do our best. Um, we certainly don't do anything with the intent of being in offensive. Um, so help us learn. It's not your job to teach us, but when we screw up, help us learn. So that's it. Good evening, afternoon, whichever it is at this point. It's been a long day for sure. I am not a doctor. I'm barely a professional. So hang in here with me. I don't know why they asked me back. I don't know what I did right. But anyway, um, as an advocate with the Sexual Assault Center here in Wichita and with a victim services liaison for the Kansas Department of Corrections, I've provided direct services for almost 6,000 victims of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, or sexual assault in the last five years. So I might know a thing or two about that specifically. Uh, the Wichita Area Sexual Assault Center does have um, advocacy in the form of a 24-hour crisis hotline. We do provide hospital advocacy in the terms of a sane SART team. We do have support groups, adult and youth therapy, and professional referrals. In addition, we have court advocacy, educational program like this one, information and community resources, volunteer and practicum opportunities. So that's the plug. Um, really what I'm here to talk about is creating safe spaces uh, for folks who identify LGBTQ. Um, like it's already been said, we know that LGBTQ folks are seeking our services, but at a lower rate than what we would really like to see. We also know that violence within the LGBTQ, primarily the transgender community, um, is quite a lot different than the remainder of the LGB. So, with the exception of B. Uh, with that being said, um, it's very important that we are able to provide these safe spaces and welcoming spaces is really what I would call them for the folks that identify under this umbrella. Like Dr. Loudon has said, check yourself. <laughs> like that's the biggest thing that I can say. Never assume. Check those beliefs and your biases. Um, of course, if someone comes out to you, don't out them in the middle of, of anything. I mean, I think we all know that as well, for sure. Educate yourself. Watch your language, use the language that's being used by the person that you're providing support for. Um, paperwork, we just changed ours at the center recently to uh, be inclusive of gender and or sexuality, which helps and create that welcoming space. Neutral language, of course, and appropriate pronouns are always gonna be important. Again, education, check your own biases, be it open and honest with coworkers, patients, friends, and families. Um, we have a big all are welcome here sign right in the middle of our door. Um, it's hard to miss. I think we've probably also missed out on some opportunities to support some of our cisgender folks because that's often rather offensive, unfortunately. Um, and in fact, WASAC does not have a support group at this time that does support transgender identifying folks. We did try that at one time, but we lost the cisgender females because that was a little bit intimidating. So we're working on that for sure. And of course, creating a safe space is um, an organizational team effort. It's gotta come from every single one of your employees that are around and available. 
Um, and it's an ongoing cultural awareness learning. We can never stop learning enough and being culturally aware and competent in order to do so. The last thing I want to say before Ms. Liz gets up here, um, and I can talk to anybody afterwards. Again, I'm not a public speaker, so this is really awkward for me. Um, a few years ago, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few years ago, um, our same team over at St. Joe, um, the forensic nurses there are absolutely lovely. Tina Peck uh, headed up a research team that found that about eight times someone who has been trafficked goes to the doctor before they identified as a traffic victim. That is extremely upsetting to me. Um, with that, we know that our LGBTQ population, especially our youth, unfortunately, is a large demographic there. Um, so please, appropriate screenings are absolutely essential when it comes to domestic violence and sexual violence that they may have experienced. We've got to help our young people. And we've got to help our folks that identify, for sure. Liz. Hi, my name is Liz Hamer. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I work with Glisten Greater Wichita. Um, we are... Let's see if I can figure this out. Nope. There we go. Um, and I just want to start off by apologizing. If you all saw me come in like almost half an hour late, I was at the Kansas Leadership Center workshop just before this, and I haven't figured out how to be in two places at one time yet. I'm really working on that because I could use it in my work. But um, Glisten, how many of you have heard of Glisten? Good. Like almost half. That's awesome. So GLSEN is the leading national education organization that works to ensure that LGBTQ students feel safe, valued, and respected in K-12 through schools. It's, it was founded around 27 years ago, I believe, this summer, this June. And our local chapter was founded, um, it actually were accredited three years ago this June. So we're now three years old, even though it took us about a year to get our accreditation um, from the very beginning. But we envision a world in which every child learns to respect and accept all people. Um, I'm here not as a medical person, but as the resource for K through 12 youth. So if you have, um, if you have a student, if you are a student, if you know a student, uh, most of you probably have some children in your life somewhere. Um, feel free to send them our way if they are needing some help and some support. So um, I pulled a few of these slides from one of our longer presentations. Um, on frequently asked questions that we get. So these all have a question at the top. What does Glisten Greater Wichita do? We work with K through 12 schools in and around the Wichita area. Currently, we're actually working with students in GSAs as far out as Garden City um, and some rural, really tiny towns that I'm not going to mention because it might be identifying for students, but way out in northwest Kansas and north Kansas. Um, and then there's a sister chapter or a sibling chapter um, in Greater Kansas City. And so they kind of focus on that greater Wichita area, but we help with students out near um, Emporia, Lawrence, um, and around that area too. Um, so we do, four, we do our work in four ways. And I brought some palm cards. If you'd like to take one, it has the list of the interventions that we use on the back. Um, our four interventions are all based on the research that our national office does. Every two years, we send out a national school climate survey. It's actually out right now this summer. So again, if you know a youth ages 13 and up who identifies as LGBTQ and you could help us get out the information about this survey, that would be amazing. Um, we got this last January, we got our first Kansas snapshot from the national school climate survey because we were able to have over 100 students take this, the survey from the two year period before. And so we use that data to go and speak with educators and let them know what our students here locally in Kansas are experiencing. So it's very valuable information. Um, but we, these four interventions are designed around that data, um, or with that data in mind. And so the first thing we do, it, and it varies from chapter to chapter, but our chapter's priorities kind of line up in this order. Our chapter's priorities are supporting the gender and sexuality alliances and similar student-led clubs. So first, we want to support the students. And we do that through um, what were formerly called Gay Straight Alliances or GSAs. Our students um, here, we have a youth summit. Last year, they decided they wanted them to be called Gender and Sexuality Alliances so that they would be more trans and intersex inclusive so that more people could feel welcome coming. Um, the similar student-led clubs, some of the clubs that we have helped start in the middle schools 
wanted to go with something a little more broad, and so they started a Students Against Prejudice Club. So it still um, enumerates that they help LGBT students, but they also enumerate that they help students of all races, religions, ethnicities, um, among other things. And so we support the students in these ways through our days of action, um, which I think I have a slide on next. So the next one is um, developing student leaders. Still part of the supporting students, we have our youth summit annually. Uh, where we last year we brought around 50 student leaders and their their GSA sponsors to just peer network and get some support from each other. And we give them a list of we've already done a lot of the legwork for them. We've given them a list of local area speakers. Uh, I know Helena's on the list. Um, I think that Dr. Husseini may be on the list of people who are willing to come in and be a guest speaker for their GSA. Um, and it's like six pages. It's pretty long at this point, but. Um, we know that GSAs ha can have the most impact on their school if they are visible and strong and are doing some sort of almost curriculum. Um, if they become kind of just like a click sort of club, attendance goes down, they don't affect as much change. But if they're doing regular things um, like participating in days of action and such, um, they, they tend to have a more positive impact on the school climate. Um, the other part, this one here, providing professional development and support for educators. Um, sorry, I'm having a problem with holding the microphone so you can, so it stays steady. Um, providing professional de development and support for educators is our second priority here for our chapter. Um, it actually became, we ranked them in this order, and then the PD piece for educators actually turned out to be a little bit easier. It was easier to connect with the educators than it was for the students. Part of that might be because most of the people on our team our educators or former educators, so we have those networks already in place. Um, but we have um, a professional development coordinator who is a school psychologist with USD 259, and he sets up professional development for us either to host on our own, where we invite people from all over the state to come and take six hours of professional development. Um, are there any teachers in the audience? Okay, oh good. So um, if you are a teacher, you know professional development sounds incredibly painful, right? So six hours of PD sounds like it might be torture for most educators. Um, but our, our PD is very interactive. Um, it's very engaging. And we, at the last one that we had, um, June 1st, we actually had three people who had already gone, bef gone through it before, and they came back again because they wanted more. Um, and actually, because it's done in small groups and it's so very interactive, they actually did get something different. They got different discussion. We facilitate the process that helps educators learn how to create spaces in their classrooms and their schools that can make sure that they value and respect all students. Um, and some of that includes some of the things that some of the previous presenters said about how to change your language, maybe, or how to um, change some of your curriculum or your classroom, how to set up a classroom so that it looks inviting and, it, and that students know that that's a safe place for them to go. And then the last two things that we do, our last two interventions, are championing, championing LGBT inclusive curriculum and uh, working on policies. And we do that both at the, or all three, at the state level. Um, National Glisten works at it on the national level. Here locally, we work with Tom Witt of Equality Kansas a lot to work on state policy. In March, we took up a busload of, um, I just read the number, I think 27 students to Topeka. We had 14 chaperones to meet with the legislators so that they, the legislators could see our students' faces and the students could learn how to advocate for themselves. We did some training with them beforehand and we went up and um, it was an, a really incredibly powerful day. We did it over spring break. And um, so we work on the policy at that level. And then we also work at the policy on the district level and the school level. Um, sometimes that looks like procedures. We help the educators understand what might the procedures be if they get a trans student. How can they change their name badges? How can they change the name in the system? How can they legally, how can a family legally change the name? We help with that a little bit as well so that they, they can go back to the school and get their name changed on their documents and their gender markers changed on their documents at school. And so we do some of that help as well with the procedures for some of the policies too. Um, thought I lost the clicker. Okay, so um, just real quickly, because I like pictures, <laughs> I like visuals. Um, 
through the supporting GSAs and developing student leaders, some of the things that we do are our days of action. Um, so we have Ally Week in September, and that in the last couple of years has evolved into making sure that LGBTQ students um, feel empowered to let their allies know what they need from them. So the last couple of hashtags in the past couple of years have been things like hashtag my allies blank. And so might be my allies use my pronouns or my allies listen first. Um, and so Ally Week is an entire week that we encourage the GSAs to participate in in the schools. And um, we've even seen some of the middle schools do it last year. It was incredible. Um, and it, it creates that conversation and that dialogue in a school for how to embrace diversity, how to um, have tough conversations sometimes in some conservative, conservative areas. And then day, uh, I'm going to skip down to Celebrate Kindness Week, No Name Calling Week. That's in January. This past January, it actually fell between Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday on Monday, and that Friday was um, the election. And so <laughs> there was... Really, we didn't think ever at the time that Celebrate Kindness Week was needed a little like more. <laughs> and so we asked the students to lead us through that. Like, what does Celebrating Kindness look like? What does No Name Calling Week look like? And we have a creative expressions exhibit that we ask students to submit creative pieces. It could have been poetry, music, art, sculptures, whatever. Um, they could take pictures of it and send it in. And we had a little, um, wasn't a competition because we didn't want to grade anybody's. Uh, creative expression, but just a little challenge for them to send that in, and we drew a, um, a name. Somebody got some movie tickets for that. But that's something that some of the schools then participated in, too. And again, it, it creates that conversation in the school where they can talk about how do we create acceptance for diversity? How do we embrace diversity in our classrooms and in our school? And then the fourth one, or the last one, third one, I've had a long day. The third one is Day of Silence, and that's in April every year. And Day of Silence is just a day that students all across the nation take a vow of silence in order to raise awareness of the silencing effect that anti-LGBT language has on LGBTQ students. And so students will take a vow of silence. They have palm cards, or they can put something on their phone that tells people why they're taking that vow of silence. And then afterwards, um, at the end of the day, we have a Breaking the Silence event rally, um, and it's kind of one of our biggest events of the year. It was, it used to be our biggest event. It's now tied with a couple others, but um, we had over 100 people come at this last one in April. Uh, we have community partners that we invite. Helena was there. Um, I don't know if, see if I see any of our <laughs> community partners. Sometimes WSU Office of Diversity and Inclusion is there. This year, Starbucks created a Starbucks Pride Alliance, and they came and gave free coffee and free, free um, cake balls, cake pops, whatever. They were very popular. Um, so those are just some of the ways. I'll also click again. Um, then just a visual for our PD. Um, those are some of the ways that we support students. And again, if you know of any students that may need our support, we do um, direct uh, intervention with students as well. Um, if a student comes to us and says, something is going on in their school and they need some assistance. We usually have that conversation with them. Like, do you want us to go in and have the conversation for you? It's not our preferred method. But sometimes students don't have, maybe they want to remain anonymous. Or maybe um, it's just too much pressure to go in and speak with an administrator if they're having an issue with an administrator. So we can do that. Or we can have the conversation with them where we say, you know, can we go in together and we'll just support you, we'll back you up. And we can give them all of the research, all of the data, all of the talking points that have shown helpful, have proven to be effective when we have these conversations with administrators. Or the third one is we just sit like totally behind the scenes, we give them all that information and send them on their way and have them do it themselves. Um, and then if they need to call us. Um, we've done it all three ways. Uh, I think the most effective is when we go in together and the student knows that we're there to back them up, but we let them, or not let them, we hope that they do the, most of the speaking and encourage them to do most of the speaking and, the, and engaging because it really makes the most difference for educators when students are speaking up for themselves as opposed to when somebody else is engaging on their back. But I think that's all. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yes, Lisa would like me to mention our two local or two local pro programs. So in addition to the Days of Silence, we have the Youth Summit. And then at the end of the year in May, we do a Rainbow Tassel program. So any graduating senior that has participated in their GSA through high school gets a Rainbow Tassel from us, along with a Certificate of Appreciation for participating in change in their school. And we send that out to the GSA sponsors, and then we encourage the GSAs to have some sort of a Rainbow Graduation celebration in their school. Let's thank all of our speakers one more time.